how nice that you are tuning in to yet another episode of Smarter by the Second Obacus. Uh, today is the 15th of June, June 15 and 1844. Charles Goodyear, an American self taught chemist and manufacturing engineer, received patent number 3633 from the United States Patent Office. He received this patent for a hardening process of rubber, which involved the treatment of natural rubber with silver. And now the question for you guys at home is what is this process called? Uh, you can answer this question by clicking on the link in the chat and we send you to a Google form and please submit your answers and you can win a great prize. And with us today is uh, Jorn. Welcome, Jorn. Yeah, hi. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm really excited to, uh, to win this. Uh, good to hear. So uh, could you uh, shortly introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so I'm Jorn. Um, Currently, I'm doing a board here at Abacus, uh, so you might know me. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, what else do you want to know? Just uh, whatever comes into your mind. So what is your function in the board, for example? Um, well, as most of you know, hopefully, um, I'm uh, Officer External Affairs. And I, I mainly talk with companies, um, which I still find a lot of fun, even after doing it for an, well, almost an entire year. Uh, yeah, so next year I will just continue with my bachelor uh, and then hopefully finish uh, somewhere next year as well. All right, so uh, the board year is now coming to an end. So uh, what is the, the, the one thing you will remember from this year? Mm. Uh, can I already use a lifeline for this? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I don't Too know. Many great I, I don't think there, there will be a single thing that will stood out the most uh, political correct answer you can't uh, choose between all your committees uh, which you've supported uh, of course all right so uh today you are playing for the category science so uh why did you pick this uh, category well i just looked at the the other categories and and i know even less about them so <laughs> uh, yeah, it was kind of an, an easy choice. So how are you feeling about uh, joining at all, uh, if this is your reason? Well, uh, yeah, it, it's worth a try, so why not? It, maybe I get lucky with the questions. We'll see. So about what we're going to do today. Uh, today we will play at most four rounds, and in each round, nine answers will be shown on screen. Uh, I will ask a question or show a photo, and you have to tell me the corresponding answer. Uh, in the first round, you need five of the nine answers to be correct. In the second round, six. In the third, seven. In the last one, all nine of them. Uh, during each round, uh, your time will be ticking, and you start off with 300 seconds. Uh, to help you, you already mentioned this, you have three lifelines. And once used per lifeline, uh, one false answer will be counted as right. But a lifeline will also cost you 16 seconds. Uh, but if you complete a round completely correct, then you will get another lifeline. Uh, and once you have survived the first three rounds, you will receive the amazing prize of an abacus cookie uh, at your own choice. But if you are feeling confident and have enough time left, uh, you can choose to play the fourth round. Uh, and all answers need to be right here. But if you succeed this, you double your bet and you get two cookies. But if you feel you only get the participation trophy, which is a small apple pie. Oh. So uh, without further ado, I think we can hop into the first round of today. So surprisingly enough, uh, while well, crypt uh, cryptography has been around for as long as the end of the Phoenician civilization and longer, it wasn't until much later that the term uh, cryptography was truly coined. The term was introduced in 1843 when Edgar Allan Poe used it in his short story, The Gold Bug. Unfortunately, we're not here to dwell in horror mystery literature, but we are certainly interested in the cryptography portion of it. In this round, nine codes and uh, ciphers. So I will tell you a description and some fun facts about uh, the, the code or encryption, and you have to tell me the corresponding answer. No uh, photos or anything on the screen. All right, All right, so the nine options you can choose from are RSA encryption, pointage manuscript, the Shukbaro inscription, the Pioneer Plagues, the Enigma Machine, Stasar Shift, Cryptos, uh, Visionaire Square, and Albertus Disk. So are any of these uh, familiar to you, Jorn? Well, 
few. Uh, I think and I, I, I hope I can make it to five. Yes, if you have uh, five correct answers, we move on to the second round. All right, then uh, we will start the round. Uh, used by the Romans, we used it to encode his military messages. Its shift is as simple as the cipher gets. Shift. In 1467, an architect described a curious device. It was a disc made up of two concentric rings, the outer ring engraved with a standard alphabet with the inner ring. The 16th century cipher used the keyword to generate a series of different Caesar shifts within the same message. So simple to use, this a method of coding resistance. square. Uh, on the Shepherd's Monument in Staffordshire, an unknown craftsman uh, carved eight mysterious letters between two other letters, D and M. Uh, thousands of would-be codebreakers, including Charles Darwin and Charles Dickens, have searched for an answer. Uh, the Schubborn inscription? The extraordinary codex from the 15th century is filled with bizarre illustrations and written in a unique alphabet that the New Orleans the infamous coding device may have looked like a typewriter, but hidden inside was the most and complex. In 1990, the CIA teased its own analyst by installing a sculpture with a complex four-part code on the grounds of its Langley headquarters. To date, only three of the four parts have been sold. No, pass. Uh, called public key cryptography, this type of security protects most electronic communications today. Okay, sir. Uh, it depicts us, our solar system, and our location in the universe, and are encoded with one of the properties of hydrogen as the key to decipher our message. Uh, the pioneers plague and then fill in the last one, stop the time. All right, so those were the nine questions. Now you need to have five correct answers, but you can use lifelines. Uh, I think I have. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about the last two, uh, so, well, there are at least five, so uh, no lifelines. It's good to hear that you're uh, confident. Then uh, we can move on to checking. Uh, the first one, used by the Romans, who used it to encode his military messages. If this is as simple as a cipher gets, all you have to do is substitute each letter in the alphabet by shifting it right or left by a specific number of letters. This is the Caesar shift. So there's your first correct answer. Then in the 15th century, an architect described a curious device. It was a disc made up of two concentric rings, the outer ring engraved with a standard alphabet and the inner ring engraved with the same alphabet written out of order. And by rotating the inner ring and outer ring, you can get the cipher. It's the Albertus disc, so two in a row now. Then the 16th century cipher uses the keyword to generate a series of different Caesar shifts within the same message. Though simple to use, this method of coding resisted all attempts to break it for over 300 years. It is the Visionaire Square. That's already free. Then on the Shepherd's Monument in Staffordshire, an unknown craftsman carved eight mysterious letters, the O U O S P A V V, between two other letters, the D and M. Thousands of would be code breakers, including Charles Darwin and Charles Dickens, have searched for an answer. But uh, it's the Shugborough inscription. So only one more needed, and then this extraordinary codex from the 15th century is filled with bizarre illustrations and written in a unique alphabet that no one has ever identified. It's the Voynich manuscript. So congratulations, we're moving to the second round. Then the infamous coding device may have looked like a typewriter, but the hidden inside was the most complex cryptographic system of rotors and gears yet devised. The Enigma machine. Then, at the end of the 20th century, the CIA teased its own analyst by installing a sculpture with a complex four-part code on the grounds of its Langley headquarters. To date, only three of the four parts have been sold. It's uh, Cryptos, so the one you left out built incorrectly. And then the eighth is the public key cryptography. This type of security protects most electronic communications uh, today. It's a uh, RSA uh, encryption. And then it depicts us, our solar system, and our location in the universe, and are encoded with one of the properties of hydrogen as the key to decipher our message. It's the pioneer plagues. So that's a nine out of nine. So you also get a, a fourth lifeline. Mm. And uh, we move on to the second round. Uh, British chemist uh, John Newlands was the first to arrange the elements into a periodic table with increasing order of atomic mass. He also found that every eighth element had special properties and called it the law of octaves. However, the modern periodic tables introduced by the Russian chemist Dmitry Mendeleev. 
difference was that Mendeleev left gaps, understanding that in between certain elements, there were still undiscovered elements. In this round, nine chemical elements. Uh, I will tell you a short description about them. And then the elements you can choose from are magnesium, phosphorus, silicon, fluorine, neon, hydrogen, sodium, fluorine, and mercury. So what about uh, chemistry? Uh, that's something that uh, is also uh, part of your qualities. Uh, well, not not really. Uh, yeah, only the abbreviation is sometimes used in the Christmas puzzle. So maybe if you so say the uh, the abbreviations, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, because when you signed up, uh, you told us that. Uh, because, uh, <laughs> Yeah, when you signed up, you told us that you would like uh, all four rounds to be about cryptography, but uh, of course, this is not a, enough of a challenge to you, so you already got one. And uh, at least you aced that one, so we'll see how this one goes. All right, then we will start the second round. Uh, element with atomic number one consists of only a proton and an electron. Proton. The second most abundant element in the Earth's crust by weight, it is used a lot in semiconductors nowadays. Silicon. This is the lightest alkali metal. It is found mostly in combination with so non-metal. Element with atomic number 12. When it's on fire, it produces a bright white light and was used in photography. Only metal that is a liquid at room temperature. It was used in thermometers and manometers, but due to its high toxicity, it is probably the most electronegative element, which makes it one of the most reactive elements. Uh, Bosch. Noble gas, it gives off a bright red light under spectroscopic discharge. For this Nail. reason, it's used in... It can exist in two major forms, a white and a red form. The element is important for a lot of plants and has fertilizing effect. A phosphorus. Uh, halogen, it can be found in table salt. In, in isolation, it can be found as a toxic gas. Uh, chlorine, and then the last one is fluorine. Stop the time. So there were no abbreviations, so I think you need well, any live um, ones. There need to be six uh, correct answers. I think there are at least six correct. Yeah. Uh, no lifelines again. All right, we'll see how this one goes as well. Uh, then the first the element with atomic number one consists only of a proton and an electron. It's uh, hydrogen. Then the second most abundant element in the Earth's crust by weight is used a lot in semiconductors nowadays. It's silicon and the lightest alkali metal. It is found mostly in combination with non-metals, making some of the most uh, soluble salts, the sodium. And the element with atomic number 12, when lit on fire, it produces a bright white light and was used in photography. Nowadays, it is used in fireworks and marine flares. It's uh, magnesium. And the only metal that is liquid at room temperature it was used in thermometers and manometers, but due to its high toxicity, it has been replaced by other less toxic substances. It's uh, mercury, so only one more correct answer needed. And the most electronegative element, which makes it also one of the most reactive elements, fluorine. So congratulations, we are doing a third round, uh, Jorn. And then a noble gas, it gives off a bright red light and a spectroscopic discharge. For this reason, it's used in certain types of lights. It's neon. And then this element can exist in two major forms, a white and a red form. Uh, the element is important for a lot of plants and has a fertilizing effect. Phosphorus, but it means that also the last one is correct. This uh, halogen can be found in table salt. In isolation, it can be found as a toxic gas. It's chlorine. So uh, up till now, uh, no incorrect answers. So we will move on to the third round. And you also get another lifeline, by the way. So you have now five of them. Uh, the origins of a computer are quite different from what we uh, would nowadays view as a computer. However, devices to aid in computation can be traced back to prehistoric Africa, where a tool called the Ishango bone was uh, possibly used for aid in computation. Of course, I cannot talk about ancient computers without mentioning the abacus, or swan pan in Chinese which have originated already over 2,000 years ago. In this round, nine parts of the history of the computer. Uh, 
I will give a short description and you will also see them on screen. So the options for this round are the NIAC, a transistor, a punch card, a difference engine, a vacuum tube, Alan Turing, Charles Babbage, Lord Kelvin, and the Chocard machine. So the computer is closely related with uh, cryptography. So uh, as a member of both the, the, the COCO and the www.com, you uh, yeah. should know this, uh, I think. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's hope so. Um, with the COCO, we use um, a bit more up-to-date equipment. But um, yeah, let's see. All right, uh, so a short description and also the picture will be on the screen. Then we can start the runs. A mathematician considered by some as the father of the computer, he invented the first mechanical computer. Uh, Charles. A device to control electric current flow can be used as a diode or cathode, uh, for example. A vacuum tube. Uh, a device fitted to a loom to manufacture textiles which, uh, with complex patterns. It uses punch cards to uh, program the machine. Gosh. A semiconductor device used to amplify or switch electronic Transistor. signals. Uh, the first programmable electronic general In purpose digital computer. Uh, mathematical physicist, inventor of the first modern analog computer, yeah, differential Kelvin. analyzer. A piece of stiff paper that holds digital data. The data is represented. Calculating machine designed in the 1820s. They are automatic mechanical calculators designed uh, to tabulate polynomial functions. Difference engine. Uh, the mathematician and computer scientist. He was highly influential and in the development of theoretical and then computer the science. The last one is machine. Stop the time. So because this is the third round, you're only allowed to switch two answers. So seven of them need to be correct. You still have uh, 82 yeah, I... seconds and five lifelines. Mm, I, I think seven are at least correct. Maybe I switched two, but that's still OK. Uh, yeah, so then again, no lifeline. So, I, yeah. You are living on the edge, Jordan. All right, then we oh, will. Yeah, otherwise, I, uh, I have not enough time <laughs> left for the, the final round, of course. Ah. <laughs> so now you already uh, revealed Jory your, uh, your choice. But now, first, we, let, uh, we have to see whether you make it uh, there. The first question, a mathematician considered by some as the father of the computer. He was also the inventor of the first mechanical computer. It's uh, Charles Babbage. Then a device to control electric current flow can be used as a diode or a cathode, for example. It's a vacuum tube. And a device fitted to a loom to manufacture textiles with complex patterns. It uses punch cards to program the machine, the Chocard machine and a semiconductor device used to amplify or switch electronic signals. It's a transistor. And we have the first programmable electronic general purpose digital computer. It is Turing compute, uh, complete as well, the NIAC. Then a mathematical physicist, inventor of the first modern analog computer, the differential analyzer, was also the president of the Royal Society, and it's Lord Kelvin. And a piece of stiff paper that holds digital data. The data is represented by the presence or absence of holes in certain positions. It's a punch card. So there's your seventh correct answer. So uh, you at least have the choice to do a fourth round. Then the calculating machine designed in the 1820s. They are automatic mechanical calculators designed to tabulate polynomial functions. The difference engine. And lastly, the mathematician and computer scientist was highly influential in the development of the theoretical computer science. It's Alan Turing. So uh, 27 out of 27 now. You're building up uh, quite some record here. Let's make it uh, 36 <laughs> out of 36. <laughs> All right, so uh, that means we will do the fourth round. So still 82 seconds, and you also get another lifeline. So that uh, means you have six of them. But do remember that it will cost you 16 seconds for each lifeline. So if you want to, to use them, 
you have to uh, speed up this round. Because uh, one lifeline will not be of any use because all nine of them need to be correct. So if you want to use them, make sure you do this round within uh, 50 seconds. All right. Uh, as Stephen Hawking once said, we are just an advanced breed of monkeys on a minor planet of a very average star. But we can understand the universe. That makes us something very special. And this runs nine astronomical phenomena. And then the phenomena that you can choose from are the nebula, an asteroid, a brown dwarf, a dwarf planet, a regular planet, a black hole, a white dwarf, supernova, and a red dwarf. So this is something completely different uh, again. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, I think it should be doable to get at least a few correct. Maybe all depending on the description. Um, yeah, yeah. I, yes, think, uh, um, I think I will make it. But, uh, we'll see. Yes, I will only give a description so you uh, will not see them. And then uh, we can uh, start the round. So astronomical body orbiting a star or stellar remnant. It has cleared out its own the orbit. The smallest and coolest kind of star, also the most common type of star in the Milky Way. Uh, red dwarf. A powerful and nucleus explosion happens during the last evolutionary Super stage nova. of a massive star. A substellar object, it isn't massive enough, enough to trigger sustained nuclear fusion. Uh, us. A region of space-time where gravity is so strong that nothing can escape from it. Yeah, cool. A stellar core remnant composed mostly of electron degenerate matter. It is also a very dense object. White dwarf. An interstellar cloud of dust, hydrogen, helium, and other ionized gases. A nebula. A minor planet of the inner solar system. Most of them in the solar system can be found between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. An asteroid. Astronomical body orbiting a star or stellar remnant, it has not cleared out its own orbit. It is massive enough to be rounded by its own gravity, but not massive enough for a firm monocular fusion. Uh, mm, I don't have enough time left to. Uh, um, let's go for the dwarf planet, and then the other one is the brown dwarf. Stop the time. Yes, so there are only six seconds left, so unfortunately. Those six lifelines are of no use to you. Mm. So you have to do this all by yourself. So what do you think your chances are? Well, the, the first seven are correct, I think. Um, I'm only not sure about the last two. So um, we'll see. I see there's an F in the chat, so uh, let's see. <laughs> No peeping at the chat at uh, these times, sure. <laughs> All right, so uh, moving on to checking. So the first one was the astronomical body orbiting a star or stellar remnant. It has cleared out its own orbit, and it's massive enough to be rounded by its own gravity, but not massive enough for a firm monocular. Uh, but uh, new fusion, it's a planet. I think we're all very familiar with a planet as we live on one. And then the smallest and coolest kind of star also, the most common type of star in the Milky Way is a red dwarf. Then a powerful and nucleus explosion happens during the last evolutionary stage of a massive star, the supernova. Then this is the one that you passed on. It's a substellar object. It isn't massive enough to trigger sustained nuclear fusion. And this is indeed a brown dwarf, so this one is correct as well. Then a region of space-time where gravity is so strong that nothing can escape from it. It's a black hole. And a stellar core remnant composed mostly of electron degenerate matter is also a very dense object. It's a white dwarf. Then an interstellar cloud of dust, hydrogen, helium, and other ionized gases is a nebula. Then a minor planet of the inner solar system. Most of them in the solar system can be found between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. It's an asteroid. Then an astronomical body orbiting a star or stellar remnant. It has not cleared out its own orbit. It is massive enough to be rounded by its own gravity, but not massive enough for Fermi nuclear fusion. It's a dwarf planet. So uh, very good that you took your time there on the last uh, two options to uh, make sure that you picked the right one. Congratulations. I think you are the, the first contender which has all 36 uh, questions correct. 
and you will also leave without using a life line. So uh, you still have seven of them. So, uh, yeah, well, I, I didn't have any time. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I would probably have used them. <laughs> uh, then it, it's good that you uh, took uh, took your time. So now uh, you look more big brain uh, <laughs> than in the other case. <laughs> so uh, congratulations. It means you uh, get the, the, the biggest reward of two cookies and also the small apple pie. Uh, but we Ooh, yeah. also have more winners because we also had the, the question for you guys at home. And the question was about the uh, the, the treatment of natural uh, rubber with sulfur uh, for a process of hardening rubber. And this process is called vulcanization. And the winner for this viewer question is uh, Hugo. So uh, congratulations to you as well, Hugo. We also hope to see you one day as a contender here on the show. But you are not, not the next contender, as uh, we already have a, a participant, and this is uh, Justus. So uh, remember to tune in next time when Justus is uh, playing. So uh, I want to uh, round off with uh, saying once more again, congratulations to Jorn. Yeah, thanks. Very impressive performance here today. And uh, thank you all for uh, watching at home. And I hope to see you next time as well.